obviously there's only two people in old Tokyo that are third generation owners of their business. And one's a mortician and the other's me. <laughs> well, Fugetsuto is a Japanese confectionery. We specialize in mochi. We are a family owned business. You look at the generations of employees that have worked for us and how all these employees have become part of the family. But the store itself has this overlying passion to exist. You know, it just, it wants to survive. And, uh, and that's why it's still here. It's not just a little candy store. It has connections to our culture and to our religion. Grandpa had gone to Tokyo from Gifu and studied how to make Japanese pastries under a company named Fugetsudo. Same name, but back in those days, there were many stores named Fugetsudo. They are all different owners at the time, but they all used the word synonymous with Wagashi store or Mochi store. There are two basic kinds of pastries that we make, which is all under the name of Wagashi. It's either Manju or Mochigashi. Uh, manju is made with cake flour, so that's Yaki Manju. The one that's baked, we call that Kuri Manju. Mochigashi, on the other hand, is made with sweet rice flour or rice flour, and it generally has a sweet bean paste inside of it. Uh, so, Uguisu mochi, Kusa mochi, pink mochi. And then to trick you all together, after that, we have one that's called Kuzu manju. It's heated and steamed, but it has no cake flour in it. So, there's exceptions here and there. Yeah. My uh, grandfather was the first Japanese confectioner in the United States. This one cracker that he made, it was sweet. He'd fold it up like a taco and put a paper haiku poem inside and then bend the sides down. And that's the predecessor to what we know as the fortune cookie. In 1903, my grandfather and my grandmother, they opened the store. You know, they settled here because it was an area that nobody wanted to develop. Back in the day, this is the only place you can get Japanese food. You didn't get tofu at Ralph's Market. You didn't get, you know, you didn't get mochi at, you know, Vons. This community was just forming. And Grandma had this reputation of welcoming people at the port. And my father kind of has the same. I've heard stories of, from younger first-generation Japanese men that met my father in the bars and that my dad took him under his wing, tried to teach him how to adapt to the United States. I guess that's where I get it. You know, it's been passed down to our family to be very helpful and be kind to those that need help. When the talk came about me taking over the store, I wanted to make it very clear with my dad well, Dad, how long would be long enough? What if I do want to change careers? 10 years down the line, could I make a change if I decided this wasn't for me? 15 years or, or how about the 100th anniversary? He says, yeah, yeah, 100 years is enough. The first year I took over the store, I did well. The sign that was here during my grandfather's days it had already been moved from outside to the inside of a showcase. The museum wanted to know if I would donate it. Immediately after that, things started turning on me. Things started turning on the entire community here in downtown. You know, with the riots and 9-11, and nobody wanted to come downtown near the high-rise buildings. And at one point, I was the only store on half of this block. This went on for for like quite a while, and I went through an Al photo album that was from our 70th anniversary. This album had a page of a photo of the sign, and in Japanese he wrote, this sign knows everything. It dawned on me that if the sign does have a spirit, I gotta go back and get it. So I went back to the museum and asked if they would release it back to me, which they did. And sure enough, you know, things started changing after I brought it back to the store. 
the sign was taken, the only piece that was taken with them to Heart Mountain, and they came back with it. We weren't told very much about camp growing up. People would come in our stores and always say, oh, I know your mom and dad from camp. And we say, yeah, oh, okay. With no perception of what camp must have been like. But if you go to, go to Heart Mountain, you see how desolate it is. You can see how windy it gets, the dust, how cold it must be in the winter, how hot it gets in the summer. They had one barracks, communal living with the entire family in one room with boards that had gaps in them. My mother, who rarely complains about anything, she loves sweets. I remember her saying, I just hated bread pudding. And that was the only sweet thing that they had for dessert and until grandpa started producing mochi in camp. I've heard the stories and talked firsthand to people that said, well, yeah, when I was a little girl, I, I'd be told to go to so-and-so's family's barracks and pick up sugar from them on the way to Mr. Quito. And so they would have these regular people that would give grandpa a certain portion of their sugar ration in order for him to produce the manju. They tried to make life as normal as possible when they were in camp. Once you see the families uh, setting up Boy Scout troops, setting up baseball leagues, you start to realize that, yeah, they're Japanese, but they're living an American life here. These are all American citizens. My, both my mom and dad were American citizens. They were married in 1945 uh, in Cody. Mom did not have a wedding dress on her wedding day. They never told us this stuff when we were children. Uh, up and through high school, we didn't know nothing. You know, they, they kept it all from us to make sure that we were American first. They basically shut down the culture in a way. Now, in my case, because of the business, I had no choice but to revert back into the culture because, of course, it's surrounded by our culture. And my grandfather and my father, the only place they knew was L.A. And after the war, they actually slept at the Koya Sun Temple, which is right here on First Street, uh, before Dad was able to find work um, and get enough money to start up the business again. They had to live the American dream twice, uh, once before World War II and once after. You would hope that something that happened to the Japanese American would never happen again. And it seems like so commonplace to know that. And yet it's aggravating to think that we're even getting close to it at all, even considering part of it. It is a, a quite uh, sensitive issue for us because of course we're gonna come to the rescue. The business climate here in Little Tokyo is definitely not a certainty right now because of the changes of property values and things down here. But I've been through this before. We've had a rough history. I must have gone through about a good 17, 18 year period where Little Tokyo was a really tough place to do business. I don't know how many times I wanted to close the store. So for us to survive that, I don't know how we did but we did, but it was painful. And yet it would have been more painful to give up on the store. My son is 17 years old. He's been in the store like every day from the time he was born till the time he was seven. And he's gotten the same feeling of the store and all the people that work in there as I did when I was younger. He's decided he wanted to do the business when he was about seven. He says, I'm going to take it over. And I thought by now he would maybe have some reservations, but no, he's still committed to running the store. I don't think Grandpa probably ever imagined that it would go this long. And when I look at, you know, friends of ours that have businesses that are 40, 50 years old, I think, wow, that's a long time, you know. And then I have to stop to think, we're at a hundred and over a hundred years now, over 110. I thought we were gonna, I was gonna be out of here at a hundred anniversary. I, I probably had a window to escape at one point, but I didn't take it. In hindsight, 
yeah, I guess I'm glad I did not. But, you know, you always wonder too, it's like, what if I did not take over the store? Would life be easier or harder for me? I suspect it would be easier, but then again, it became part of my, my blood to not only protect my store, but to protect the community. People will come and marvel, it looks the same because we have generation after generation of customers. Now we're talking about grandmother and grandfather's age coming to our store, and it's, a, it's kind of a, a location of comfort because they remember that store when they were kids, and they bring their grandkids, and their grandkids are getting the same thing. And, and I realize that, you know, it's like five generations and getting back to that spirit uh, issue of this store has a spirit of its own. Well, that's part of it. You know, the memory is still alive.